Welcome to Truth Telling with Elizabeth D'Alto, the podcast dedicated to focusing on the truth that is always evolving within us and around us, where we explore the potentiality of truth as a highly esteemed value at a time in history when most people have more on their plates than any one human should. If you're new to me, full expression is my jam. Some words people have used to describe me range from speaker, trainer, coach, healer, writer, spiritual advisor, teacher, podcaster, and someone even called me their soul Sherpa once. I'm less concerned with titles or labels and more interested in results, change, and creating a world we want to, can, and are proud to live in. A kinder, gentler, more curious, collaborative, reverent world where people respect each other's backgrounds, experiences, and truths. They trust in themselves, in life, and recognize that we need each other. And they know how to cultivate healthy relationships to true power, not the very unhealthy kind of power our current culture is predicated upon. Speaking of our culture, there's a lot of noise and ignorance in our current culture, and this show aims to cut through that by exploring the truths of a diverse range of incredible voices, from authors, artists, creatives, and educators, to activists, speakers, and those in various scientific and esoteric fields, our guests hail from cultures and countries all over the world. We post a new interview every Monday, and if you want to keep up with the show notes and quotes from our guests, you can follow me on Instagram, at Elizabeth D'Alto. You can expect a wide range of topics when you tune into this show. Everything from health, communication, money, success, parenting, desire, sex, love, and spirituality, to making pivots and transitions in life, and topics related to psychology, storytelling, gender and race issues, emotional intelligence, activism, advocacy, and much more. A few disclaimers, no episode of the show is meant for everyone, and every episode is meant for whoever needs it on the right day at the right time. Not all guest views will reflect my own, and that's intentional. We don't learn, grow, heal, or improve by staying in our comfortable bubbles with all of our people who look, think, or live exactly how we do. If you love what you hear and find it useful and inspiring, the best way to show your appreciation is to share the episode, subscribe to the show, and leave us a rating and review wherever you listen in from. Thank you so, so much for being here with me. Here we go. Welcome to episode number 264 of Truth Telling with Elizabeth D'Alto. Today's guest, Barry Tesler, is someone I've been acquainted with for many years now, and more recently, we had the opportunity to drop in at a women's leadership event, and I was so pumped about this. Barry is a financial therapist, which, to be honest, is not something I even knew existed until she said it. She's also the creator and author of The Art of Money. It's no secret that I love soaking up wisdom from women who are further along on their life path than I am. And this is one of the reasons I was pumped to have Barry on the show. Her big truth was about getting her ass kicked by perimenopause. So we spent some time talking about that. And we also discussed how she's working to leave a legacy both in her business and through parenting her son. She also shared her story, the training and experience that led her to create her integrative approach to money, which includes the antidote to money shame and the relationship between urgency, responsibility, and thoroughness, among other things. This was one of those interviews I wished could have gone for a whole extra hour. So we'll definitely have to have Barry back to talk more about her methodology and other things specific to the art of money. But we covered some incredible ground here. So I hope you love it. Again, this is episode number 264. So for links and resources to anything we mentioned in the show, head on over to untameyourself.com forward slash TT-264. Again, that's untameyourself.com forward slash T as in truth, T as in telling dash two, six, four. Everybody, per usual, I am super pumped to have today's guest with us. And you know what I love? People who listen to the podcast are used to this. There's so many people in my world who I've known for many, many years online, and I've had less like real life interaction with them. But um, so Barry was one of those people up until only like a couple months ago. We actually got to do a little like deep dive drop in at this awesome event called Gaia Women Lead. So um, if we would have done this any sooner, you would have been one of those mystical internet people who I liked and had only like met in passing once. But now I feel like I know you much better. So welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. I'm excited too. So before I ask you the first question we always start with, I want to just like acknowledge something Since we rebranded the show from Untame the Wild Soul 
to truth telling and have focused more on, you know, being more inclusive, having deeper conversations that are more related to society and culture than necessarily spirituality and self-help. I, I don't know that I've had anyone on to talk about money since then. One of the reasons being, um, and this is the thing Barry and I were talking offline, a friend of mine shared an article by another friend of ours yesterday, uh, an article on entrepreneur.com where this white man was talking about like money and success. And I know this guy and he's super successful and they're great and they're good people. But my response to this was, I'm having a really hard time these days reading about things like wealth and success from the perspective of people with so much privilege that barely or completely don't acknowledge it. It feels tremendously incomplete to me, especially people I know and like in real life. So for anyone listening, as you're sitting here and you're like, oh, here are these two like white or white passing ladies and they're going to talk about money, like if you're doing like the side eye or the okay, bracing yourself. Uh, I met Barry at a conference about social justice. So one of the reasons why I'm excited to have you here, Barry, is because I know that the conversation will acknowledge and will include that we know we have a ton of privilege, but we're still going to talk about money. And it could hopefully be a bit cleaner than some of the other conversations I've had in the past when I was yeah. a little less aware about all the things. Does that make sense? It all makes sense. I'm excited to talk about all of it. Um, my own experience, I'm Jewish, but I'm very light skin. Mm-hmm. So yeah. yeah, a lot of privilege with that. And I'm Jewish. And so there's that as well. Huge uh, stereotype around Jewish people oh, and yeah. money. <laughs> And then there's exactly Jews and money. So I'm open to talking about all of it. I know you are. So here's the first question, which is what is a truth that's having a big impact on your life right now? So even the word truth is something that I don't ever walk around saying like, this is my truth. But I sat with this question and there are many things and some of it was around privilege and around my lineage and ethnicity. But really, the reality I'm sitting in right now is that I'm about to turn 50 within six months. My son is turning 10 and I'm turning 50 and I'm in perimenopause and I'm getting my ass kicked in perimenopause. And there are days where my emotions and sensations are so wild and so incredibly high. And then there are other days where the clarity of my vision and what I'm doing and what's going on is incredible. And there's this whole new thing about legacy that is knocking at my door. So it's this combination of getting my ass kicked. And I've, you know, went through my 30s, didn't have a child until right before 40, then postpartum, then a nice light, nice break in my 40s, <laughs> being an older mom, and then boom, perimenopause hit. And this is different than any of those other previous phases as a woman. And this is one of the things I love about talking about womanhood because there are so many phases and cycles and they hit people so differently. Like for some people, honestly, I know so many women who have gone through menopause and I never even heard of perimenopause until like this year. And I can't stop talking about it. I'm like screaming it from the rooftops, even though I try to talk about other things. <laughs> but it's it's a big reality and topic yeah. in, in my life. So much so that my son the other day, I mean, we talk about it a lot in my household, which is wonderful, you know. And But my son did say, wait, this has been going on for a few years? You didn't tell me. You know, it's just so cute. <laughs> like, he's nine. He's so interested. Uh, my husband could say, yes, it's been going on, and he thinks I'm a changed human from it. So, yeah. Are there any – I mean, I know you know your book is The Art of Money, and I'm, I love your philosophy around money, and I want to talk about that. But before we move on from perimenopause, are there any just like gems or pearls for anyone listening who's approaching it or in it or even has gone through it and maybe didn't acknowledge the fullness of the experience that feel important to you? or even fun to share? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm still in it. And it, it went, we don't know how long it's going to be, you know, it could be five years, it could be 10 years. Uh, I felt it creeping up a few years ago, when I came back from an Art of Money roadshow, we rented a tiny RV as a family, we flew out to Seattle, me, my husband, my son, and my mother in law, and we interviewed 
people, my students, my colleagues from Seattle all the way down through Portland, through California, wound up in Santa Cruz. And I, and I came home from that. It was so fun, but it was exhausting. And I felt like I can't get out of winter. And I kept saying mm-hmm. that. And then it was spring and then it was summer. But I was like, oh, I'm still in winter. I cannot get out of winter. And that was the beginning of it. And then it progressed into a phase where I just wanted to blow up something like <laughs> And then I started hearing stories where people blew up their marriages or people started overspending and shopping online like crazy or, you know, they blew up their work or, you know, and I, I really wanted to blow up something, but I had the awareness to know I don't want to blow up my family. I don't want to blow up my work. I don't want to blow up my marriage. You know, we're coming on 18 years and I just rode through all of that. Um, and I'll just complete that. There's so much about body and I've, I'm not dieting through this. I'm trying to add in things like exercise, but there's so low energy that I have to push. But I got a trainer. I got a great tattooed, um, muscly trainer who's so kind and like gives me such great pep talks and understands perimenopausal women. When I said to him, have you worked with perimenopausal women? He said, yes, and we're going to have some fun. You oh, know? That's, a, that's the response you want to hear to that question, as opposed to, no, what's that? <laughs> no, what's that or what's going on? And, and just to complete, you know, just adding in support, adding in the trainer, adding in the green juice, even though I, I've never liked juice with my coffee, you know, and keeping my coffee. Yeah, that. I'm just going to add it. <laughs> But adding the green juice because I found one I liked and um, just adding in things. And the last thing is that there was something that happened this year and all of a sudden I realized I'm kind of at a ceiling, whether it's a money ceiling, a number ceiling of how much my business is making, I'm in a great business model, or I'm just in a ceiling of where it can go because this legacy piece kept knocking on my door and all of a sudden I realized I need, I have a virtual assistant. I have an online business manager. I have a co-writer. I also have a bookkeeper and an accountant and a financial planner. So who else could I need? But I just wrote up a little description of what this person could be who could help me in my business. Look at the numbers and talk about legacy. What does that even mean? Mm-hmm. And I wrote up a little descri- description, sent it out to my team and some close people, got back some referrals and this one CFO, I knew exact. I knew it was. I knew it was him. I knew he was my guy. And we started three weeks ago. And I was starting to feel a bit hopeless, which can also happen in moments of perimenopause, or just in moments of our business. I just haven't yeah. felt in years because I have such a good business model. And I reached out to him, and we've started. And he's just getting into the numbers with me and starting to review things. And one question he asked was, if if you two options, if we're going to raise the price of your program, would you do that? Or which I haven't done in six years, or would you create something new? And I knew immediately I'm not, I'm, I do not want to raise the price of my program. Uh, let's create something new. I have no idea what that is. Anyway, those are the quite questions he's asking me and to add in a CFO. I feel like new life has come in. I feel like he's going to take me to this next place and help me move through something that I've been doing for the business for years, but I can't see everything. And I couldn't even see that I needed someone or that I was yeah. really to go ask. So that feels all somehow <laughs> get the trainer Get the acupuncturist, you know, get the new CFO or your version of that. In yeah. This place, get those people. Yeah. Your version. <laughs> yeah. You're super smart. And even if you think you're super savvy and can take care of all of this, get the support. What I love about this is, first of all, many people listening are entrepreneurs and they're going to be hearing what you're saying and applying it to the lens of their business. But I also hope people who are not entrepreneurs can see how this applies in their life. Because there's so much for us, I think, especially as women, who many of us are cultured that our value is in what we can give um, and how much we can manage at once. Mm -hmm. And there's so much that falls under categories that I call just because I can doesn't mean I should. And I'm with you because last year I hired a project manager. And even just adding that into the fold, I'm not needing her as much this year because I am actually scaling back and taking some space to reevaluate my business model. But just adding her into the mix and having that piece off my plate, not a zone of genius for me, not even close. Uh, like, and I think that's the problem. I think a lot of us probably have zone, lots of things in our zone of excellence. We're like so good at it, 
really doesn't mean we should be doing it. Right, right. I've seen that in so many other ways, but somehow I didn't see it with helping with projections and cash flow and numbers. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, so. Well, and I wonder too, is because what you do is about money, was there any sense of like pride or attachment to that, that it should be you? Um, I just didn't even know that someone else could help me with this. I wasn't willing. It was a closed door. Yeah. Yeah. It was just a closed door. It was like, I do this. I've always done this. Yeah. I had a business partner 11 years ago and she came from an accounting world and did budgeting and she did more of that, but I just felt it was just a closed door. Yeah. It was a closed door. Yeah. I think, and I think there are like, there's always almost like, like you're saying closed door and I'm hearing blind spot, <laughs> like one way or another, it's something that you can't see until it's like time to see it. Right. Time to see it. Yep. So yeah. tell us, I hate asking people to do overviews, but because you have such a cool way with things, I would love you to give us an overview of like your money philosophy, your approach to things. Also selfishly, I just love hearing you talk about it. And, and I can share a little of my story because I have to share a little bit of that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Explain. Right. So I, I grew up middle class Jewish family in Chicago. My family was in real estate. And then my uncles, my two gay uncles from New York who would go, we would go visit every year when I was a little kid. <laughs> um, I even got my cycle there. You know, it had to be with my uncles. Like they were just everything to me. They taught me about so much. So, and they wound up moving to Chicago at some point and opening up gay bars with my parents. So that was my world, you know, in Chicago. I grew up dancing, doing a lot of jazz dance. Uh, 20s found African-based dance. And, you know, I, th I thought I would be a solid gold dancer. Like, that's the only thing I could say as a that's little amazing. girl. A solid gold dancer. Then when I had to write that seventh grade career report, I wrote it about being a businesswoman. I didn't quite know what kind of businesswoman I was going to be, but my father was a businessman. And a lot of my journey to individuate, individuating was off my father, not my mother, because me and my mother are so different. Me and my father are similar. Mm -hmm. um, and then also a lot, of, uh, a lot of tendencies around addiction or th that I had to transform. Right. So it was bouncing on my father. So I wanted to be a businesswoman. And then as a teenager, I asked to be a ther I asked if I could go to therapy. I asked my parents if I could go to therapy. And they said yes. They sent me to male therapist, which wasn't a good move, but so I just played a lot of mind games, but it was a great beginning. And then undergrad college was no clue. I was studying women's history and African American history and some Jewish history because I didn't know what I wanted to do, but those topics interested in me. And I was, you know, reading Audre Lorde, you know, as a 19, 20 year old, she came to my college. That's amazing. I feel like that was the only thing I did was I got myself. I remember exactly where I was sitting, you know, in, mm -hmm. in to see her and to listen to her. I went by myself because I didn't have any friends who I could go with that would, I thought would get this, understand this, appreciate this. And, and then I went to Israel for a year to take a break because, you know, my fa I had taken Japanese for a few summers in a row. That was my father's plan. His vision for me was to learn Japanese so I could come back and do business with him. And I was going to go to Japan to teach English. And at the last moment, I said, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it, Dad. And he said that was like the, the, the you're making the biggest mistake, that, you know, in your life. And I said, OK. And I wound up going to Israel because I needed to understand what it meant that I was born into a Jewish family. Mm -hmm. I wanted to understand this more. And I went there. And when I was in Israel, I was jogging on a kibbutz one day. And all of a sudden, the light bulb went on. And I 
decided I was going to put together dance and therapy into one field. And I thought I made up dance therapy and <laughs> study, you know, <laughs> I get to Jerusalem and I learn I didn't make up anything. There's somatic psychology programs. There's master's degrees in this. There's dance movement therapy. It's been going on for a long time, but I was so excited. And that's when I felt I found my work and I came back to the States and moved to Boulder, Colorado and, you know, went to graduate school to train to be a therapist and a body centered, a somatic therapist, because I needed that so bad for myself. Yeah. I want to pause for a second. I love, this is what makes me believe in collective intelligence. I've had so many of those moments over the years with Wild Soul Movement and people who listen to the podcast regularly and loyally have heard me say this before. There's so many things that I think that I have thought. I've had moments of thinking I invented something only to realize that like all I've done is synthesize many things that already exist. <laughs> Which is just cool because we are tapping into that collective. Yeah, yeah. I just didn't even know about until I was in my early 20s. And, yeah, because how would you? There's so many things to know. Right, right. So the, to actually just experience it and then hear, this is a thing. This yeah, is a thing yeah. that we can do. Um, and I spent my 20s, you know, doing my own deep work because I needed therapy. Yeah. And I was working in the mental health field. I was leading authentic movement groups because I could never do sitting meditation. I was like, I hate sitting. This doesn't make sense to me. But movement meditation yeah. makes sense to me, you know. And I learned authentic movement. <clears throat> and that's what I practiced. And then, you know, a, a lot of very close men in my life, four of them died in my between the ages of 20 to 25 so my Israeli boyfriend committed suicide right when I came home. My beloved grandpa, who I love dearly, died while watching football, listening to his favorite opera mm. in his favorite chair. An incredible way to go, you know? And then both of my uncles died of AIDS, different, different types um, in my 20s. And that was also happening in my early twenties and also why I needed to be in graduate school to be a therapist. I needed to be healing and doing my own work. And that's what I was doing in my twenties. And so I really thought my topics as a therapist would be grief and death. Uh, you know, I worked in hospice, um, during those years. So grief, death, intimacy, sexuality, food, body, all that, all those topics. That's what I thought. And then my school loan came due at the age of 28. And I just freaked out. I flipped out. I thought, I'll run away. I'll become a nomad. <laughs> I never learned about money. Did anyone else? And then I looked at my graduate program and I realized we talked about all those other topics and then some and never money. I was like, how is this even possible? I went to graduate school to train to become a therapist. I wanted to work around intimacy and couples. If money is, um, you know, supposedly the number one reason people get divorced, it's more we don't know how to talk about money, right? We don't know our own money stories. But anyway, so we didn't learn anything about money, how to start our own businesses. And it just became such an obvious missing piece for me mm. that I chose I'm not going to go screaming, running away. I'm going to face this research this on every single level, practically, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, just like I've done every other topic. And, uh, you know, bookkeeping was my very first stop, but I also thought I was the only one with this missing education, you know, as we all do. Yeah. I had big shame. I thought I'm the only one who sucks around money. I'm the only one who didn't learn this. And pretty quickly I started looking at my community from all different economic class backgrounds, from all different lineage, ethnicity backgrounds, religious, spiritual backgrounds, realizing none of us or some of us received parts and pieces of a money education, but most of us did not receive a money education from grade school and up in small increments. Yeah, you're jumping in. You want to jump in? I have, like, this is one of those things <laughs> where, and Barry, for those of you listening, Barry can see me, and anyone who's ever seen me in a video knows I'm, like, very animated. Both my hands are up. I'm like, oh, I just want to overemphasize. I do this sometimes. Is anyone listening? Because we do. Money, I think, is something that is a huge source of shame, practically universally. 
And I'm sure you have found that in your work or could speak to it better statistically than I could. But um, realizing that like across the board, so many of us don't get this education until we find ourselves with like feet to the fire because we owe someone something and we have no idea how we're going to pay for it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And, you know, it was, that's what I started saying is that no matter what background, no, where we, no matter where we come from, we, you know, even in my family, it came from an entrepreneurial family. And so I was steeped in it, but I didn't learn direct lessons, mm -hmm. you know, on how to manage money and what to do with it. Um, I have lots of stories about that. My younger brother, who's almost six years younger than me, I know he got teachings from my father about real estate and investing in real estate. I did not get that, you know? Um, so for me, if I was going to take this on, this topic on, I had to bring all of the tools and the practices that I was living and bringing to every other area of my life. So it had to be creative for me. It had to be deeply meaningful to me. It had to have some sacredness to me, all of that. Yeah. And, you know, I wound up learning bookkeeping first and having a bookkeeping business for about from the ages of 28 to 32. I always say I learned so much more about people by doing their bookkeeping than if I was their therapist. They never would have hired me as a 28 year old therapist, but they threw their books at me. They didn't even know I had a master's in psychology. They could care less. They wanted to have nothing to do with their bookkeeping. And these were therapists and coaches and artists and contractors. And I learned so much about cash flow patterns and people spending and income. I, you know, I felt like, here you go. I got to see everything. Um, and that was fascinating to me. And then pretty quickly, well, at the age of 32, that's when it all came together. I realized all my past training needed to be integrated with the language of money these bookkeeping systems that I was falling in love with, I never thought I could do. I was not good at math growing up. Um, I thought this area of life was just boring and dry and dull. And honestly, I knew I was smart in many ways, but not in this way. And so when I was taught Quicken and QuickBooks and I could learn it, it just blew my mind open. And I loved it so much. And pretty quickly, the other piece here is that I started creating this methodology, um, which integrates money healing and money practices and money maps, you know, the practical, the emotional, psychological and spiritual, it all needed to be in there. Cause I would go to traditional money books and they would talk about paying down debt and learning how to invest mm -hmm. and what else, you know, all the, but it was pretty much tough love. And this is how you do it. And there's one right way, you know, and I was like, there's so much more going on. There's all these emotions. Yeah. There's, or you know. on the other end of the spectrum where it's all about like manifesting the abundance of the universe. <laughs> you know, I mean, a little about a little bit of that is lovely, mm -hmm. you know? but I need to connect it in with the numbers yep. and be practical and knowing what your numbers are and, you know, knowing what your price points are and falling in love with business models. And, you know, if you need to add in some of that sacredness, okay, you know, but just don't be doing mantras. Like, and then, it, I, I mean, some people do that and expect it's just going to come back to them. But for me, it's always an integrative approach. I, I want, all of it, you know, and from the beginning too, I wanted to teach in groups rather than work one-on-one. -on -one. I wanted people from different backgrounds in the same room talking about their money shame, talking about their money stories, their money history, where we all could be in the same room realizing that everyone had strengths, everyone had challenges, and everyone had big things to overcome. Even if you came from a wealthy family, even if you came from a poor family, even if you came from this and that. And, you know, my groups were 10 people back then and now they're much, much larger. But that's been part of my mission from day one. Yeah, I love this. You know, and so what's interesting is it always dawned on me. My family, for the most part, has been middle class my whole life, probably more upper middle class now that my mom like worked her way up big time in a career and she recently retired. But, um, you know, when we were younger, 
I didn't have the kind of money that's like some of my friends have. Like I distinctly remember being in middle school and going to this boy's house who I had a crush on and his father was like this big time lawyer. Like, and you knew, you knew who his father was because the commercial was on the TV and you could barely go anywhere on Staten Island without driving past the billboard or the building or whatever and seeing the name. And so I remember going to that house for the first time and being like, what is this? And feeling so small. And so inferior and all of a sudden so self-conscious about what I was wearing and that, you know, my at the time my parents were divorced and I we lived in like a two family house like we lived on one floor and like, you know, my brother and I had our own bedroom, but it was just like on this dead end street with like all that. So so interesting. And so there was a part of me that kind of had this belief or expectation that like just having more money would make me feel better. Yeah. And it wasn't until I was in my middle, later 20s when I got into my first like business mastermind program where one of the other women in the program was actually the daughter of a very, very, very famous musician. And so this is a person who would never have to worry about money ever in her life. And she had issues with money. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, okay. Just different, just of a different variety. That was shocking to me. And it's so important to hear that and for us to tell those stories Yeah, because yeah. we have so much assumptions and we make up so many stories and they come from when we're younger. And I remember sitting in the middle, I would see people who are so much wealthier and have all sorts of feelings around that. But I also saw people on the other end of the street too, mm-hmm. you know, and had all sorts of feelings around that. Um, but I remember some of my first groups, if there was a wealthy person in the room, many people assumed they have no issues they have nothing to complain about what's, you know, what's going on with them. And that's why my interviews, just like what you do, have been so important that I interview someone who comes from a wealthy family and she tells it like it is. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, and she says, yeah, this is I still had to work on my value. I still had stuff to work on around my body. I still had issues to work on around guilt. I think I should just give it all away. And so donating is so important, you know, important to me and on and on and on, you yeah. know, so those interviews, those are called my, I, my money memoir interviews that I've that. done for, yeah, we can talk more about that. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's very similar, you know, the listenership is mostly women, also very similar to the assumption that a conventionally attractive woman has it easier or has confidence or feels good. And, you know, now being this many years deep into my work, which was preceded by being a personal trainer, I mean, I'm shocked at how often the people who were, quote, like the prettiest by some kind of like mythical norm, which I think is an Audre Lorde term, how often those women have just as many, if not like, we're not here to like compare and measure like who has more issues. But I think what we're really speaking to is we make assumptions based on people having the things that many of us aspire to or crave or want. And it's not the answer. And it's not the answer. And we, we never really fully know what's going on with them. Exactly. Behind the scenes. We don't fully know their hardships, what challenges, where they've failed, what they've had to work on. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, if they have more money to start their business, maybe they can do things faster. They can do things quicker, but that's not always good. You know, I had to bootstrap and I did a lot of trade at the beginning and there was benefit to that as well, to going at a different pace. Again, different challenges, different issues. Um, I mean, what's coming up for me, and this is, does hit on the money memoir stuff and what you brought up in the beginning is that when the very, so I hope this is relevant. When I first started doing the money memoir series, I did it in 2014 And I thought, okay, I'm going to get a really diverse community. You know, that was the word I was using at the time. And I'm going to, and I was 33 people. I did one a day. That was like the craziest. I did one interview a day. I think my child was four, you know, and after, and I reached out to as many people that I knew and had relationships with and connections with. And by the end of the month, I looked at that list and there was a lot of Jewish folks there was age diversity um, there, but it's still at the end of the, there was sexuality diversity, but at the end of the day, it was still a lot of white faces. Mm. And I remember feeling embarrassed 
and feeling, how did this happen? You know, and this is not what the world I want to see and I need to do better, you know, but it was my first where I was like trying to, and either some people said no, or they said yes, or they didn't do the, cause I did some video, some audio, some written. And then I stopped that interview series for a few years. And then I started up a few years ago again. And I just made sure that I was going to my community and reaching out to people that, um, some were white. I always, I have a lot of Jewish friends, so there's always going to be some Jews in there. Um, and, but it was more diverse and more inclusive than I've ever been. And it's people. And one of the first questions I ask is how do you identify, you know, what is that? And one of my story, you know, my questions are how do you identify? And then how has your lineage and ethnicity impacted your money story in a positive or negative way? And please share a story on what you've had to overcome. I appreciate that. I'm like, oh man, where can I find these interviews now? Because um, one of the things that I'm sensitive to around conversations of diversity, inclusivity, and then just the practice of making sure I have more representation on the show is that I'm never inadvertently contributing to someone's ongoing oppression by assuming they're oppressed if they have already overcome. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to be like, oh, you're like, it shows my own unconscious bias. If I'm like, oh, you're in this marginalized group of people, I'm going to assume that you've struggled with something like maybe not. Right. Right. I appreciate that. I asked this same question to people who, uh, you know, again, they're white. I don't know if they're Jewish. I don't know if they're white passing. I, I asked the same question to them, to someone else, and they all have a different answer to that. Mm -hmm. Really different answer. You know, some might say I'm Jamaican American and I, we grew up middle class, you know, mm -hmm. or I'm from the South and I identify as black. I used to say African American and I also was middle class, you know, and, but again, we all have things yeah. that we didn't learn. We all have things to overcome. You know, we do. Yeah, it's super interesting. Quick break in the show to give you all a little Patreon update. If you're not familiar with the site Patreon, head on over to patreon.com forward slash Elizabeth Untamed to check it out. It's basically this amazing platform where artists and content creators and creatives can post their art and their work and their fans and followers can essentially be their patrons. They could be their sponsors. They can make donations at various levels so that people can do their work in a sustainable way. Um, and it doesn't have to be all about shady or high pressure marketing practices or anything. People can just share, be in community, and it's, it's one amazing platform to do all of that on. They have a really easy to use app. You can download the Patreon app. And some of your favorite content creators are actually on there doing their thing. So in June, I decided to create a Patreon. One of the reasons being that social media these days can be super overwhelming. And there are just things that I really want to share. I want to be able to go deeper with people. I want to be able to do more with and for our community. And Patreon is the place where I am doing that. So we have all kinds of super affordable levels that you can become a patron at and receive patron-only posts and essays that I'm writing, um, two bonus podcast episodes a month, two Wild Soul Movement practice sessions a month, as well as some other things. So head on over to patreon.com forward slash Elizabeth Untamed if you're interested in checking that out. And just to let you know as well, as I really get into doing more stand-up comedy, and I've really just been studying and researching a lot more around so many of the main topics that tug my heartstrings about the show, I'm going to be writing and posting way more over on the Patreon and it will be stuff that I will not be sharing on social media. So you got to be on Patreon if you want to check that stuff out. So that is that. Head on over there. Check it out. Invite and bring your friends. And now back to the show. I want to come back to when you were talking about being a bookkeeper first. And this was something that really struck out to me during your talk at the Gaia Women League conference as well that I could really relate to from having been a personal trainer 
it's so interesting to me how many people go into a position because they're like passionate about something or out of necessity or kind of just like that's where they find themselves, which I kind of feel like you found yourself in the bookkeeping. Um, and then don't realize how much emotional heavy lifting is going to come with the territory. You know, by you mean by being a bookkeeper and seeing other people's numbers? And, and the like, I even think of me, me, I've always been like, this is the year I'm really getting my money stuff in order. I had a financial mentor. I'm really tracking things. I have a bookkeeper. I actually pay an exorbitant amount to my bookkeeper specifically because he will get on the phone with me once a month and show me everything and make me look at it. Because to my own detriment, one of the things I've done is I've been the person who doesn't want to look at it. But an exorbitant is relative, by the way. But um, how emotional that is. It's so emotional okay. to make people okay. look at their money. Well, so this is interesting because I chose that because I needed a break from um, the emotional strain <laughs> and the burnout that I was feeling by working as a counselor and social worker in the mental health field and making yeah. eleven dollars an hour. Yeah, with the master's degree. You know, I was working forty hours a week, and I couldn't even get a massage or get acupuncture or buy really good chocolate. Like I just couldn't do any of that, you know? So there was so much exhaustion that was happening. I loved that work and I loved giving and I had no other options presented to me except start a private practice, you know, but I needed a break from that emotional psychological work. And so I then took this detour into this little tiny accounting job <laughs> in an organic bakery because I thought there'd be no emotional, mental strain. And there wasn't at first, I, you know, I thought I'd, I was in this little cubicle. I thought I'd be there a few months. I was there two years. So it actually was a break for me at first, which was really good. But then when I started doing my own bookkeeping, you know, or like hanging up my shingle as a bookkeeper and getting these private clients, it still was nothing compared to being a social worker. It still was, I could go home at the end of the day and leave it all behind. Yes. So I was um, seeing a lot, holding a lot of space as a bookkeeper. Not all good pe book, not all bookkeepers are also good teachers or trainers. Yes. They just yes. may be great bookkeepers. You know, I had this background as a therapist, so I also could sit calmly mm -hmm. while they were feeling shame or embarrassment, or you know, and calmly go through the numbers and teach them how to read the reports and teach them how to read quick, you know, learn quick books and all that. Um, but that was, n that was nothing compared to being a social worker. So right. that was pretty easy. F yeah. That was still easy for me. Um, the emotions came back into the picture again when I started being a financial therapist, you know, and started teaching the methodology and the first group I ever taught I had people talk about their history day one. Like, then, then I realized pretty quickly that was too fast, too soon. <laughs> I, I just like, I needed other tools, but I was teaching my methodology that I now teach in a year in a little six week group, you right. know, living room in an apple orchard. So I realized pretty quickly, oh, 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 we need some tools mm -hmm. on how to work with the emotions. And that's why what I call the antidote to money shame is the body check-in and the body check-in is the very first tool I give. And it came from my somatic psychology background. And so I start out the entire program, um, back in the day, any financial therapy session or even quick book session, training session with, we're going to stop and pause. And we're just going to check in on a physical level, sensation level. What's the emotion? What is our breathing doing and begin there, you know, and, and that's not something you do once and then you're done and you're like, I got my emotions figured out. <laughs> it's anxiety or anger or whatever. It's an ongoing practice that you will be doing through all the practical stuff while you're sitting with your bookkeeper or your financial planner and your eyes are glazing over, you know, and on and on and on. Yeah. I love this. So somatic experiencing therapy modalities, that's one of the things that I certainly did not invent, but it was so ingrained and just naturally came through when I was creating Wild Soul Movement. And then someone is like, oh, this is like somatic experiencing. And I'm like, oh, what's that? Because it's all about you're just like checking in with your body, which just like made sense to me. That's all it is. And from your background, I'm not surprised that, well, I'm happy that you then naturally found that. Yeah. And that was a whole field. And yeah. I love this. Um, 
and 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 the shame piece and dissolving those things. What I also really appreciate, and it's funny because I love I love the synchronicities. I'm always looking for the synchronicities. I I shared a post on Facebook and Instagram today that was basically a PSA to be discerning about who you choose to be your teachers. And you know, one of what what's relevant here is what you were just saying that you what you used to do in six weeks has now become a year long program. And I'd be super curious how. It feels like a, there's an aspect of responsibility, trial and error. You realized you were probably became a better facilitator or space holder or whatever. Um, can you speak to that part of it? Realizing that like, oh, this might not be the best, most useful approach. Because I feel like, and, and let me give a little more context. Again, I'm always wanting to like examine the conditioning and, and of our culture. Our culture always wants stronger, better, faster. And f- stronger is not always faster. Better right. is not always faster. Right. Okay. There's so much in this. I okay. know. Take it wherever you want. Okay. So there's a few places. One is that over the years, people do come to me for the quick fix. I'm like, I'm not your teacher then. Yeah. I'm not your guide. I'm not your gal. You know, go to the money manifester people. That's not me. I'm not doing that. You know, like, yeah. That's not my thing. Um, this is a longer journey. It is about slowing down. I know we all feel urgency. We should have learned this from grade school and up. So my community is 25 to 75 years old. When a 40-year-old or 50-year-old suddenly wakes up, and it could be a divorce or a death. It could be a bigger thing, but it could be just smaller things along the way where they're like, my relationship to money does not feel healthy, does not is not working, you know? Yeah. And of course they say, God, I wish I did this work 10, 20 three decades ago. That's, you found it now. You're ready to do this work now, you know, and it's not a quick fix. It's an entire framework that we learn. And then we are fine tuning and updating, you know, for years and years and years until we die. But the methodology in itself, I'm about to celebrate 18 years. That's awesome. Doing this work. And yeah, I met a mentor 18 years ago, who said, Oh, you're trying to integrate, you know, your therapy training with this bookkeeping stuff. And, um, I want you to give a talk to my community and I'll get 25 people. And I was like, what are you talking about? I don't give talks. You know, I was just terrified. I was, you know, terrified. And I realized, okay, I got it. She's inviting me. Like she just was like, young lady, step it up. It's time to do this. So I went out into the woods and I just, like I do, and I asked my questions like I do, you know, and I got some information. And I basically was asking, what is the framework of my methodology? What are the concepts? What, how am I supposed to teach this, you know, to someone like me? Um, and I came back with the three phases, what I now call money healing, money practices, and money maps. Back then it was financial therapy, values-based bookkeeping, and life vision planning. And then I gave the talk. Yeah, I was terrified. I remember like I could barely even stay in my body. You know, mm-hmm. I was like doing the body check in. I was terrified of public speaking. All my comments to myself were, you suck. You're not smart enough. You don't, you're not articulate. You know, I just did the whole thing and talked myself down from that whole thing. And then now I love speaking mostly. You know, I- She's so good. Everyone listening. She was so moving. I think I cried three times during your talk. And what I loved about it, and I think I already told you this, so I'm just hyping you up for the audience. Um, The way you integrate storytelling and to demonstrate the methodology and the practice and how it works was just so, like, I was just with you the whole time. So keep going. Thank you. You're amazing. That's all I'm saying. I did practice that for three months. So I did. It showed. It really showed. You know, Um, and you know, from there, I just started teaching these tiny little groups, as I said, of 10 people, I did six week classes over and over and over in my living room. Then I would drive to San Francisco one night and Oakland the next night, and then Marin the next night and, you know, and then telecourse and then they moved to 20 person. And the way the methodology was created was trial and error. It was, okay, here's some beginning handouts and worksheets, my little baby handouts. And then people would respond or they would react or, I realized pretty quickly we'd completely left out forgiveness, Mm. forgiveness of self, of other, if they had a God, you know, 
I, I, that's how I created it over and over and over, you know, to, to where it became 50 person groups over six months, you know, now, and basically it was almost seven years ago where I was hitting 44 and I just felt I was maturing, you know, I felt I'm maturing. My community has matured. I'm ready to teach the year-long program. I had all the content. I've been interviewing people for years. You know, I had the library. I had 11 months of content. I just needed to create one more month. But it was really that trial and error over and over and over and over, and and then finally creating the year-long program. And that's what's in the book, and that's what's in the year. And is it done? No, but it's in a pretty – Dialed. you dialed in and then I, I know what the questions come up. I know when people yeah. get freaked out, that's why I have TAs that help assist me. And I, I don't know everything, but there isn't anything that people say that surprises me yeah. and I know how the whole thing goes. Yeah. I love this so much. And again, like I'm going to bring it back to that post because this is rampant in, you know, this coaching industry that we exist in that overlaps with a couple other industries, online marketing, self-help, personal development, all these things. There's so many people who become popular seemingly overnight. And some of them it's because something goes viral or some of them just like does Facebook ads and like all of a sudden they have this big audience. But just because someone has a lot of fans or followers or likes or shares or comments doesn't mean that they've done like what you just described. Doesn't mean that they've like mastered their craft or developed their program or have gone through all these tweaks. Like to be a person like that's a masterful teacher that like there's nothing that someone can bring up that's going to surprise you. You know, and you've had so many different experiences with it and so many different types of people in your programs. And this is what I I, like. I'm so passionate and I overemphasize this because I am such a stickler for great facilitation and teaching and space holding because I also see how many people are jaded and also harmed and even traumatized in some cases from not that. And I would say and in addition to that, what I didn't even mention was all the behind the scenes work that I was doing with my husband, exactly. you know, he was not 18 years and cut the couple work, mm-hmm. you know, that my husband used to sit with a little piece of paper and had five categories cause he didn't make a lot of money or we didn't make a lot back then. So we only needed five categories, you know, or just all the work we did there. And then all the work that we're attempting to do with our child, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, and so there's that as well. And, for me, seeing mentors or teachers or guides who not only teach a methodology, but also who are really, really walking the talk yeah. and really yeah. open to sharing their mistakes, their failures, what works, what doesn't, the things that they're still working on yeah. and what yeah. they're fine tuning. That That's what's so important to me. Yeah. Oh. I get like, I feel like everything I invite people to do on this show takes so much more time, energy, and intensity. <laughs> I deeply appreciate anyone that continues to show up for this. <laughs> I'm, I'm the same. I'm the same. Yeah. 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 But it doesn't, the thing is, it won't burn out, you know, like the, we're just, we're kind of like the slow burn people, but we're still going to keep going and things will definitely get better over time. And that's our pacing where there's other people that do have that yeah, quicker yeah. growth. And I've watched many of those, even in my third or fourth or fifth or sixth year going, wow, you know, <laughs> should I do that? You know, like, should I do this kind of two day free marketing thing so I can, you know, mm-hmm. and I just, and it was over and over again, like what kind of marketing works for me, what I would never, ever, ever do, what I will do, what I won't, who I am, what I'm not, you know, and that that translated to a much slower, steady pacing there. And then I did have a leap when I went to my year long program, I went from like pulling teeth that year to get 50 students. And then the first year we had 320 students and, and now we've over 500. So there it's mostly slow, steady, 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 steady. And then I have had one or two leaps in there. Well, and that's like the actor or the actress who you've never heard of. Like, so for example, for me, I think of Ali Wong, the comedian. I literally never heard of her until a couple months ago. And then all of a sudden there's her new Netflix special. And I'm like, how have I been missing out on Ali Wong? And you go to find out like she's been grinding for over a decade. Yeah, I loved it. And then I watched her. Yeah, I loved it. So I was like hysterical. Dying. And then I watched the first one and I was like, I love that this woman has two Netflix specials. She's like seven months pregnant in both of them. I love I love everything. We could talk. I loved everything about it. I love how she smells her fingers. <laughs> I, you know, so 
lifting up her skirt the whole time. Oh like, my god! I, I mean, this was like, sh- oh my, she could. Be, I, I wish, I, she's my girlfriend. Like, yeah, I, same. I love. Same. Yeah. That actually inspired me after seeing that was one of the things that put me over into like doing my first stand up open mic. I'm like, I have to do this. I can no longer pretend that this hasn't been a desire in my heart since I was eight years old. Amazing. And the marvelous Miss Maisel, too, which people keep telling me I haven't checked it out yet, but okay. I have to. Very different, but loved every single piece of it and incredible Jewish humor for me. You know? That's amazing. Yeah. So when there is a person who's like so rich and dynamic and, you know, can take a conversation in so many different places, uh, sometimes I just like to begin to wrap up by asking, is there anything I haven't asked you that feels like it's bubbling up or you just like really wanted to make sure we talked about it or? Oh, I mean, what's really up is the menopause thing, which we talked about, yep. the CFO thing which I'm so excited about. Um, My money memoirs, which I feel like there's so much more there to do. And it's, Mm. it's one of those, I don't even want to call it a project, but it's, um, I'll just say there's a book proposal due in a few months. (laughs) I got a chill. I got a chill when you said that. Good. (laughs) And it's related, (laughs) to this and I'm sure it's going to kick my ass in other ways and in good ways. You know, I'll have to dive deeper into my own story about being Jewish and my family escaping Russia and their money stories while I'm starting to go deeper with many other people's lineage and ethnicity and their stories. And so that's, yeah. That's on the horizon. I love that because I think one of the, you know, we talk, we've been talking about privilege a lot and I think it's super important. It's something that so many people don't have an awareness of, but then there's also so much, something people hear me say all the time is nuance and complexity, nuance and complexity. So I love that you're saying ethnicity, lineage, story, because just because someone has a certain skin tone doesn't mean that they're going to, like, not everyone has the same story. Not everyone has the same experience. There's so much nuance, complexity, individual experiences. And we all have different, you know, we all have different privileges. Mm-hmm. We all have different challenges. And that's what I'm learning over and over. And those are the stories I want to hear. Yeah. Yeah. More, more and more, you know, because I only read, well, I read some novels, but I'm on a huge memoir kick and have been for years and years and years. I'll just name three. Yeah. I I'm on, did you see my Facebook post recently? I was like, what I memoirs? Did. I'm on a memoir kick. And I'm yeah. like, what memoirs do I need to read? So hit me. And, and, and a lot of the ones that were on there. So the light of the world by Elizabeth Alexander, gorgeous. Um, just mercy, Brian Stevenson must read. You know, um, uh, okay, so, but the ones I just read were The Girl Who Smiled Beads. What a beautiful title. Yeah, by Clementine Wamaria, who, um, yeah, was in Rwanda during the war and escaped at six years old. Wow. Um, and, uh, And then... Uh, I, uh, sick about from, I don't know, Porochista, um, Kakpur, and she's written a few novels. She's Iranian American. And this is about her journey with Lyme's that was undiagnosed and misdiagnosed and, um, for years and years and years. And then the last one was Padma Lakshmi because I just love Padma mm. Lakshmi and it was, it's about, you know, food. And travel and her growing up in India and then coming to the States and all of that. I love that. I want to hear all the stories. Amazing. And you know what? I did I did think of something that I want to ask you on your way out the door here as well, which is so you have a nine year old son now, and I know what I love, I don't particularly feel inclined to have children, but I love watching the journeys of all of my friends and acquaintances and people I know who have children. And I'm like, all of these children with these like conscious parents who are like really doing their work. I cannot wait to see the superhumans that you all raise, like no pressure. But um, maybe just like one or two things. Financially, I will say from my own money story, part of what I've had to unpack is having 
way too many things shared with me at an age where I did not have the emotional intelligence or maturity to hold it. So okay. I'm super curious what you feel, right? Because everyone's opinions will be different. What are the types of things at the age of nine are appropriate that you share with your son in hopes of like training him and evolving his consciousness around money? So either people have families where things were shared too much, mm-hmm. right? Or nothing was shared at all. Like right. you don't speak about this or it happens behind closed doors or you hear yelling behind closed doors around money. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, it was more just, there was no direct teachings or there was a yeah. lot of, there was a lot of like control around money for me and then not teachings around what to do with it. Like I had to get a job at 15. Um, but I didn't, wasn't taught how to go apply for a job or do I want to do a job that I love or how do I, you know, what does that even mean? Or when I went to college, I had to send my father, I had to, um, uh, photocopy my little manual bank statement of where I was spending my money, you know? And like, he, he knew, the bag of pot, the bag of weed, like he knew <laughs> all of that. And then there was no commentary on, you know, his thoughts or feelings or what was okay or what was my budget or what was my limit. I just had to photocopy where I was spending, but like that there was no discussions, you know? Yeah. So that was what was maddening for me. It was like, there was a lot of generosity in some way, but then crazy conditions yeah. And it was explained. Okay. So that was a big part of my upbringing. Um, with our son, Noah, we've been trying to, what we think are age appropriate things from like age three to four and then five and six and seven and eight. And I've written very little. I have like, I think three blog posts and tons of stuff about couples. Cause I only like to write about things that I've experienced. Yeah. So, or that we've done. And so I was always just studying my child too, because it's what's age appropriate developmentally, but also where's your child at, you yeah. know, with three and four, I remember, or maybe at three, we would go through target and he wanted everything yeah. and instead of like, um, squelching his wants or desires, he's three or two years old. We would just do the silly thing, not, you know, just going through the aisles of like, put everything on your wish list. And we just did that for a while. I had a lot more time and I was like not working as many hours because I wanted to be with him. That was part of our activity. He just put every single thing in an aisle on his wish list, wish list. And then we would go home and that would be it. You know, I didn't want to squelch it. Um, Then we moved on to like needs and wants. What does that even mean? We would to like Nordstrom Rack and I would say, okay, can we pick two shoes out of these five? What, you know, that was kind of a hard concept. You as a, you know, as a four-year-old or five-year-old. Um, but which ones will you like the most out of these? And, um, and then we started moving into a little bit of the saving, spending, giving jars, you know, that everyone talks about, but we had to find our own way with that. Yeah. So we've moved into like, there's a whole thing around, um, um, allowance. Well, I don't like that word, even allowance and I'm big on words, but we do give him money and then we have chores, but they're not connected. So he gets some money for being a part of the family and he gets to spend that however he wants. And recently we moved into more donations, sitting down as a family and discussing where we wanted to give. I love including him in that. That's awesome. That was a, that was a huge thing. And there is a very, that was new for us. I'll back up a second and then speak to that. So he does some chores in the house. Again, I don't even like the word chores, but like we want him to contribute to the house. So I'm yeah. teaching him Swift. Do you know what a Swifter is? The Swiffer, yeah. Swiffer. You know? <laughs> he likes it. Put away his clothes and bins that I labeled, you know, like little things that he can help with. So he does things for the house to help contribute. And then he gets this, this money every week. They're separate, but they're both just part of being a part of our household. Yeah. Then we're trying to teach him more things about how to use that money, That's like cool. how to save some, he can spend what he wants, and then the donation thing. And as I'm teach, as I'm talking with my son, this ties back to our original thing about what is happening in our culture that may be new for us as white skin people, but it's not new for a lot of people. But as I'm teaching my son about his Jewish history, I'm also teaching him about what's happening with young black boys and police brutality 
And recently we were talking about the terrible death of Anton. I'm forgetting his last name. And I was talking with him about this boy. And, you know, that's, I'm, I, these are the conversations that me and my son are having. And it was a year ago where there was a terrible hate crime where he, the boy is okay. I mean, not, you know, he was physically okay after this, even though psychologically he needed some therapy and that's going to take some time. And Noah, my son wanted to donate to him. So part of our conversations at home around our privilege, also being Jewish and what that means, and also what's happening in our culture um, is tying in sometimes to who we want to donate to and sometimes not at all. It's more just Um, those are new teachings that, um, I didn't necessarily get in my household, even though, you know, my gay uncles were a huge part. So we got it there, but not so much around race. Yeah. I appreciate this a lot because as as you're saying that I'm realizing so many of the things that I've had to learn quote the hard way and I'm still learning now or because I didn't have a lot of direct teachings. And so brilliant. Thank you, Barry. Um, is it Barry Tesler.com or the art of money.com or both? No, it's Barry Tesler.com. Okay, great. And we'll, we put everything in the show notes. We'll put the books, your book links to anything else that you want us to share with people. Um, thank you so much for this. I love exploring things. I love exploring things with people like you who can kind of like go into all the corners and crevices of the things, even if it's like a little weird or awkward or uncomfortable, which I don't think any of this was, but I just throw it out there anyway. So None of it was. I'm like, oh, my God, there's so much more to talk about. Like, there's so I'm much just, more. You know, you know, part of me is like, do I need to go to a Tim Ferriss model and start doing like two to three hour podcast interviews? Because I basically always leave, for lack of a better term, with blue balls because I just have so many more things that we could have talked about. I, I, I don't feel same. like I finished. <laughs> I feel the same. It's fine. You'll come back. <laughs> um. All right, Mama. Thank you so, so, so much. Thank we'll see you later. You. Thank you, everyone, for listening, as always. Well, my origin story is the first time I organized, it was um, as a gangbanger. I was the first white girl in the Rolling 30 Crips, which is a black gang in, um, well, throughout L.A., mostly West Coast. Have you heard about the Crips and the Bloods? Yeah. So um, when I was 16, um, the boy I found fell in love with was a co-founder of the Crips. And that's where I did my first organizing. And the organizing was around ensuring that my friends could eat. <laughs> and it was a simple thing in Denver, Colorado at the time. Um, it's when crack cocaine hit the streets. And so um, what was happening is that there was a community that was addicted to drugs and the people that were impacted were my friends. Um, and the only access we had as teenagers was, OK, so this my friend doesn't have food. How are we going to get food? We don't have any money. Uh, so that was my first organizing. Um, and then after that, shortly after that was around graffiti and how do we organize a crew to put messages on the wall that says we are here and we're not going to be quiet. Um, So, and then I went into Universal Zulu Nation, which is a hip hop organization, um, the longest standing hip hop organization that exists. And I was rocking as a Zulu queen. And that was about organizing um, young people to really get in touch with their power through the mission of, of hip hop culture, which is to uplift and inspire.